As soon as videotape left the factory, it already started to break down. Information that is on the tapes is slowly dying, and if we don't preserve them, important historical content that's contained on them will be lost forever. What is MePOPS? What is MePOPS? What is MePOPS? MePOPS stands for Moving Image Preservation of Puget Sound. What MePOPS does for the general public of the Pacific Northwest is provide access to digitized content. Our mission is to raise awareness about the magnetic media crisis, the alarm that the Association of Moving Image Archivists sounded to sort of bring awareness to the urgency of digitizing videotape. Audiovisual Archive in Australia has put a deadline of 2025 to say if you don't have your magnetic material digitized by this time, you're, you're screwed. They're figuring out the actual date and it's right around the corner. Within 20 to 30 years of the time it's created, it's, it's disintegrating. The magnetic media crisis is sometimes called a gathering storm because the deterioration of the actual analog videotapes and then the increasing obsolescence and rarity of the players that play them back. So video is a little bit different from film in that video went through all these different iterations, all these different formats for consumer purposes, for broadcast purposes, whereas film, there were consumer formats, 616 millimeter, 8, 8 millimeter, but the principle of film has stayed pretty consistent and video requires all these different players. A lot of the formats that we work with stopped being manufactured years ago. And so we have to make sure that we take good care of them and tune them up, clean them, because a lot of the parts and players are getting harder and harder to come by, and so are the people who actually work on them. They're a dying breed, if you will. In some cases, people thought they were creating preservation copies by putting um, film onto videotape. In fact, that was that was not a great a great a great idea. Film is actually quite stable. The thing about older media types like film and negatives is that they are stable. Thirty years from now, you're going to be able to view them. Hundred-year-old nitrate film, in some cases, is still around and looks gorgeous. Rosie Video, for its manufacture, had a completely different different purpose. It was more of a kind of uh, democratizing um, format for shooting. It was a lot cheaper than film, so not only were professionals using it, but also amateurs and just the average person was able to buy videotape and record. There was plenty of access. You could watch your, your VHS tape of a film, but now that VHS tape needs a lot of help. We have to keep up. We can't just sort of settle back and say, okay, we're finished. Despite the fact that we're working with old materials that have their fixed content, the way we view that material, the way we store that material is going to just keep changing and evolving. A lot of the time, videotape is capturing real people doing real things. That might sound personal and boring, but it really encompasses so much of Seattle and Seattle's history that it's valuable to the general public and great for them to be able to access it. The public is able to see files digitized at MePOPS on Internet Archive where we create collections for each group so that they can, based on that institution, go in and view the content on their personal computer. Hi everybody, happy home movie day 2020. <laughs> My name is Hannah Palin. I am the moving image curator at the University of Washington Library Special Collections. And I love home movies. I can't help it. I started my journey to the land of film and videotape preservation through the pathway of home movies. My first job in this arena was at a small business in Seattle that transferred film to videotape. For five years, I spent 40 hours a week sitting in the dark at Pro Image, transferring the home movies of our customers, marveling at the amazing images flickering on the screen in front of me. Home movies are actually as old as the medium itself. From the very beginning, everyday lives and events were the focus of short films exploring the possibilities of this new technology. In 1894, Edison's assistant Fred Ott sneezed. In 1895, the Lumiere brothers recorded workers leaving a factory. 
1896, A Kiss was the subject of another Edison film that caused quite a stir and a lot of imitations. Over the decades, motion pictures became an integral part of our lives. It makes total sense that we would want to participate by capturing our own experience from the 1920s to today on 16 millimeter, 8 millimeter, Super 8, on VHS and mini DV, and now on our iPhones and Androids. It's a normal human instinct to want to record what we see. Film and videotape are a perfect way to preserve memories, which is one of the reasons archives exist, to bring the past into the present and make it relevant again. 8mm film was released to the market in 1932 to create a home movie format that was less expensive than 16mm, and therefore more accessible to the average household, democratizing the ability for everyone to document their lives, resulting in a more diverse landscape of home movies, events, and experiences. There's a visual language to home movies that has remained constant over the decades. Babies coming home from the hospital, toddlers taking their first step, Families at the beach or in the pool, you're anybody of water, really. Birthday parties, weddings, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, Passover, Easter. I've even seen a funeral or two. If it's a rite of passage, we've filmed it. Home movies that document travel, though, have their own special kind of narrative. Travelogues, nonfiction films that focus on cultures or mores in different locales, were and still are popular. Like if you think of Michael Palin's series like Around the World in 80 Days or Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations. So travelogues are a means of learning about places you might never be able to see in person. The home movie maker internalized that language of the travelogue, bending it to their own experience. Essentially, there's the, look at us, we're at the Eiffel Tower, the Grand Canyon, Rockefeller Center, Disneyland, so much Disneyland. Now, during the heyday of home movies, people joked that having to sit through Aunt Marge's latest trip to Europe or Uncle Fred's vacation to Lake Winnebago was the height of cultural torture. Shooting the landscape while driving the camera pointing out of a car window or through the windshield was also a must. Travel movies can also lead to the gaze of the other. Look at those people over there who are different from me. For example, we have the films of a white San Francisco socialite who traveled around the world What in 1931. And what she brought back is a pre-produced travelogue of men and women from across the globe in a kind of National Geographic narrative that points to all these different people in each country saying they have a different social status, culture, color, or lived experience from my own. So interspersed in this footage is Mrs. Ford in the look at us in front of blank variety. It's such a strange and unsettling mix of viewpoints, but it's a fascinating film. It is illustrative of the times, good and bad, nonetheless. Americans traveled far and wide and wanted to share every single thing they'd seen along the way. The home movies you'll see tonight cover a range of experiences. Travel to the East Coast, Montana, Mount Rainier, Europe, Alaska, and every mountain of the Pacific Northwest. Just kidding. These were recorded by African Americans, Japanese immigrants, people in the 1%, and everybody else. The films are fascinating examples of the genre. And my favorite, well, they're all my favorites, really, but you know, let's say I have a particular fondness for the Pell Turtelot film. It's a group of young people, which you don't see very often in home movies. Uh, there were 20-somethings who were set off to Europe with a car, again, unusual, during the height of the Depression. So they were privileged, definitely. Um, but they have a different take on the travelogue, and it's really modern, actually. It's not just the foursome waving in front of the Tower of Pisa, but it's this carefully crafted film that they created to document their journey, and it just ends up being their travel through Europe between the two world wars. So they see a run on a bank in Germany, 
Um, they drive through a World War I battlefield that looks just as devastated as it did in 1931, as it did in 1918. Um, they party on the ship over, <laughs> and they party in Berlin for sure. They do film a poster for Hansi Strum, Queen of the Lesbians. Not really sure what that was, but um, they quietly drink coffee in their hotel room the next morning. On their way home, actor-singer Maurice Chevalier is on board their ship and they capture him performing for newsreel ca uh, cameras as they come into port in New York City. Watching these films opens up a whole new world for me. And granted, it's one of privilege, but it's privilege that I don't have. And it's at a time that, and in a way of seeing that time that is to me completely new. And it, for me, is also one of historic importance as we move from one era to another. Kind of like we are right now. So, I hope you enjoy this installment of Home Movie Day. It's an event that's been happening every year since August 16th, 20, 2003. 8, 16, get it? Um, celebrating the magical, hysterical, fascinating, silly, wonderful world of home movies. So grab your popcorn and your mug of chalk, well, maybe a cocktail, and let's get traveling. Have fun out there. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.
Everything they need for the five-day trip rides in the packs, including rain parkas, proof against the clammy dampening of clothes and spirits that mountain weather so often dishes out. Five hours steady hiking brings them to the first campsite, tired, hungry, but ready to make the best of a very wet situation. First requirements, fire and shelter. Morning. Clear weather brings a startling change of scene. Omi makes sure no one misses it. He believes in early starts, figuring the less time spent fiddling around camp, the more time the party will have to cope with any problems that might come up along the trail. Now Carol works her way up an easy bit of rock as Omi watches for signs of poor balance or tendency to freeze. Securely perched, she passes the rope around her body to make what's known as a sitting hip belay. Pleased to show Omi what she knows, she gets set to safeguard Jack as he begins to climb. As Jack goes up, Carol takes in slack. There's an old song titled, It's Nice to Get Up in the Morning, But It's Nicer to Lie Abed. Omi and Matey have figured out ways to do both by having sleeping bags with arms and legs. Carol watches in amazement as they shuffle through their breakfast routine like huge, overstuffed, very polite penguins.
of you night and day. I've been afraid that you leave me, Daddy. I don't 